Hello, I'm Dr. Robert France, Director of the Mayo Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic. Pleased to present Cardiovascular Grand Rounds to you today, an update in pulmonary hypertension. A lot has happened in the past year in the world of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Today we're going to visit a little bit about survival in PAH and how that's evolved over the years. We'll then turn to issues of how we assess prognosis and treatment decisions in PAH and move on to talk on latest developments in the therapy of PAH. Now we know from the REVEAL registry, which is a large North American registry of patients with group one pulmonary arterial hypertension, that survivals have improved compared to comparable patients matched for NIH risk score, as shown here in the upper bar, showing outcome in the REVEAL registry, and in the lower panel, those patients who were in the original NIH PAH cohort. So we're happy that outcomes have improved, but you can see that five-year survival is still only 65% overall, telling us that these are high-risk patients that we need to think carefully about how we treat, when we refer, and that we don't let them fall through the cracks. Now, there are some opportunities for earlier diagnosis in PAH, which we know can be helpful in optimizing outcome. Patients with scleroderma being seen in the rheumatology clinic and, and other areas in our practices really should be screened for pulmonary arterial hypertension. We think about things such as exertional dyspnea, but some of these patients may have gotten relatively used to low levels of activity and may not actually complain particularly about the symptom even in the presence of significant pulmonary hypertension. Accordingly, we look at other markers for screening. These include the N-terminal pro brain natriuretic peptide level which is really a marker of cardiac filling pressure. And if this value is elevated in a patient with scleroderma, we need to explain that. It could relate to pulmonary arterial hypertension, or it could relate to left-sided heart disease, but it needs to be explained. An additional screen for patients who may be at risk for having pulmonary hypertension in scleroderma is to do pulmonary function tests with diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide measurement this is valuable because most scleroderma patients who have pulmonary hypertension do have a reduced diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide. Of course, that finding is not specific for pulmonary hypertension because it can also be seen in patients with scleroderma with fibrotic lung disease without PAH, but in the absence of major fibrotic lung disease, a low diffusing capacity may well be associated with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So between that measurement and measurement of the N-terminal pro BNP level, that can be quite a useful screening strategy. And then we can turn on to doing echocardiography in patients with scleroderma if there's any suspicion at all about the possibility of them being at risk for PAH. In addition, functional tests such as six-minute walk are useful. If we can identify these patients early and treat them, we do believe we'll improve their outcome. So I encourage all of you to look for your patients with scleroderma and try to find those who have pulmonary hypertension sooner than might otherwise be the case. Now, when we do find patients with pulmonary hypertension, how do we think about risk in deciding when to escalate therapy? Traditionally, we've used functional class and change in functional class, and we will indeed visit about that today. But we've also developed the reveal risk calculator that takes into account primarily non-invasive parameters that you can apply in everyday practice to understand risk in your patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. In addition, we have sophisticated echocardiographic measures of risk, including RV strain. So we'll talk about all three of these factors today. The re reveal risk calculator really was based on a multivariable model where the coefficients of risk were replaced with integers to make it simple to create the calculator. We can readily calculate risk scores with this calculator. It's really only meant to apply to group one pulmonary arterial hypertension, not to other forms of pulmonary hypertension, such as that related to left heart disease or parenchymal lung disease. This is actually available as an app for your phone, and you can just pull it up on your cell phone and calculate this risk score right readily, and I encourage you to try doing that. So if we look at outcome using this model, we can see in the upper red 
are that this can be anywhere from 97% one-year survival to 50% one-year survival based on this risk stratification technique. We really encourage you to consider referring those higher risk patients to a major center for consideration of other therapies or approaches such as lung transplantation. If we think about functional class, this is another way to think simply about outcome. We see here overall survival for a cohort of pulmonary arterial hypertension patients. And now you can see it bro broken down by functional class. That if your functional class one or two, shown in the red, you'll do much better than if your functional class three, shown in the green, and obviously better than if your functional class four, shown in the bottom blue panel. Um, to date, traditionally, we've based guidelines for treatment largely on functional class. However, this only predicts a certain element of outcome, and many patients are functional class three at diagnosis, and we need to really sort those class three patients further based on other parameters. If we think about change in functional class, this is useful. If you improve your functional class to one, two, and the upper line, you have really quite an excellent outcome. If you stay class three, the outcome is not as good. And if you deteriorate from class three to class four in the red line, this is indeed worrisome. And we really must prevent that type of deterioration if at all possible. Now let's talk a little bit more about echo imaging. In pulmonary hypertension, it's not so much the pressure in the right ventricle that's the problem, it's how the right ventricle responds to that pressure. So how do we really best assess the right ventricle by echocardiography? Well, the right ventricle really contracts in primarily a longitudinal fashion, which is quite different than we might expect to see in the left ventricle, which is more of a torsion or twisting motion. And we can take advantage of this fact in terms of how we assess the right ventricular function by echocardiography. There are simple measures of longitudinal shortening, such as TAPSI, which is tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. This is really simply the distance that the tricuspid annular plane moves between diastole and systole. It's simple, it's relatively sensitive, it does have prognostic value. However, it is subject to errors such as translational motion, and so we do not feel is as robust a measure of RV function as other parameters such as RV strain. In the Mayo pulmonary hypertension clinic, we use a very specific protocol in our echo lab to assess the RV comprehensively in our patients with pulmonary hypertension. This dedicated pH-specific study really is very useful to us in quantitating right particular function. This has included RV strain in a fashion that's been performed now since October of 2010, so we have quite a broad experience with this technique. When we look at right ventricular strain, it's really a speckle tracking technique that is looking at how far little bits of the myocardium move between diastole and systole. We can then look at that over the right ventricular free wall and then average that to provide one number that sort of sums right ventricular free wall contractility in a way that is quite sensitive and is relatively reproducible in, in skilled hands. Now, the more negative the value, the better the right ventricular function. Normal right ventricular strain would be more negative than minus 25%. And as that percentage becomes less, the RV is not moving as much, and outcome is indeed substantially worse. So we're using this really to track our patients in terms of their risk. Not only is baseline RV strain predictive of outcome, but we can also look at change in strain. Here's a retrospective analysis that we did of our pulmonary hypertension patients before and after addition of pH-specific therapies and looked at whether strain improved, as shown in the upper blue line, or whether it failed to improve, as shown in the red line. And you can see that if the RV strain did not improve, these patients were at additional risk. So serial RV strain measures, we believe, are useful. We also think about severity of tricuspid regurgitation. This is relatively straightforward to examine in the echo lab. And the more severe the tricuspid regurgitation, the more difficulty that right ventricle will have in maintaining compensation. And this indeed does link to outcome. Another simple measure that is also present in the reveal risk calculator is the presence or absence of pericardial effusion. 
This is not so much an issue usually in terms of causing cardiac tamponade, which can occur, but which is rare in PAH, but more a marker of very deranged hemodynamics that allow that fluid to accumulate in the pericardial space. And if you know nothing else about your pH patient but that they've developed a pericardial effusion, this is quite concerning and, and you should consider referring such a patient for advanced therapies or consideration of transplantation. We've also found that RB strain is incremental to these other parameters in the echo lab uh, with hazard ratios that are substantial despite knowledge of the other RB parameters. And so we do feel this RB strain is a useful adjunct to the other echocardiographic measures that we've already discussed. So if we think about outcome prediction in pH, it's really an integrative approach that includes parameters such as functional class, natriuretic peptide levels, echo parameters, and really looking at the RV response to that pulmonary hypertension situation. Let's turn our attention now to progress and pitfalls in pH therapies in 2012 and 2013. This table summarizes some of the trials that have been done in the past year, and these include the trials of the endothelin receptor antagonist Massey Tentan, the trials of the, of the soluble guanylate cyclase activator Rheosigwat, shown in both the PAH patient population and also the chronic thromboembolic population. Let's talk first about Massey Tentan. Massey Tentan has very high affinity for the endothelin receptor. Shown here are the differing washout curves for the different endothelin antagonists. And we see that Massey Tentan is very sticky to its receptor. Whether this really translates into real-world improvement in outcomes over the other endothelin antagonists simply has never been studied and we do not know. However, it is certainly an interesting compound and it was studied in the Massey-Tentan studies not in comparison to the other endothelin antagonists but either as monotherapy or as additional therapy in patients that were on phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors or oral or inhaled prostanoids with a robust composite endpoint of death, septostomy, transplant, need for IV or subcuprostenoids, or worsening PAH, and a mean treatment duration that was near two years. These patients, you can see, had incremental benefit from 3 and 10 milligrams of Massey 1010. And this year, Massey 1010, a dose of 10 milligrams daily, has been approved for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And we'll have to work out where this fits in vis-a-vis -vis the other endothelin receptor antagonists because that is not known at this time. The other molecule we wanted to talk about is the soluble guanylate cyclase activator, Rheosigwat. This is working in the nitric oxide pathway at a slightly higher level than where the phosphodesterase 5 inhibitors function that pre pre prevent degradation of cyclic GMP. So Rio Siguat was shown to have a substantial improvement in six-minute walk distance and in hemodynamics in this trial that was published in the New England Journal this summer. And accordingly, Rio Siguat is now also, also approved for treatment of PAH. It cannot be used in combination with phosphodesterase 5 inhibitors because of the potential for augmenting hypotensive response. And again, we do not know where this really will stand with regard to whether it's superior or equivalent to the idea of using a PD-5 inhibitor, but it's nice to have another option on the table. As I mentioned, this drug was also sh shown to be beneficial in patients with chron chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension who either were not operative candidates for pulmonary thromboendarterectomy or who had residual pulmonary hypertension despite having had a thromboendarterectomy, and there was a robust improvement in six-minute walk in this patient population and a drop in pulmonary vascular resistance. Accordingly, we now have this medication available as well. Now, one disappointment in the pulmonary hypertension space this past year has been a matinib. This is the first of a concept of a true anti-proliferative approach to pulmonary hypertension that we hope in the future some anti-proliferative will really revolutionize pulmonary hypertension therapy. Now, the matinib study which was a placebo-controlled study in PAH in patients who were already on other PAH therapies, did show improvement in six-minute walk distance, pulmonary vascular resistance, cardiac output, uh, but did not meet a, a time to clinical worsening endpoint 
And indeed, there was a trend towards greater hospitalizations in the imatinib group, probably reflecting fluid retention. In addition, there were nine patients in the trials who had subdural hematomas. Most of these patients recovered, but it was a disturbing finding. They were all inpatients on anticoagulation. And ultimately, imatinib did not receive FDA approval for treatment of PAH. We are hopeful that other antiproliferatives in the future may be of value, and, and we will continue to look at these agents as they come along. I should mention also oral treprostenil, which is an oral prostenoid. It, it did, did hit its endpoint in uh, pulmonary hypertension as monotherapy, but did not hit its endpoint in patients who were on other therapies and did not receive FDA approval. There are additional studies that are being done at this time that are using a different dosing scheme of giving the medication three times a day that we're hopeful that will improve tolerability and ability to escalate to a potentially more effective dose. And so I think it'll be exciting to see how those trials work out. So there are still gaps in knowledge in pulmonary hypertension, and they include optimal selection of treatment based upon patient phenotype, comparative effectiveness of available therapies as we've discussed, comparative effectiveness of available treatment strategies in terms of how aggressive we are about turning to parenteral prostenoids and so forth, and a huge need for continued study of novel antiproliferative, anti-inflammatory approaches. To summarize these recent clinical trials, Massey-Tentin and Rio Sigawat will have a role in treating PH. The extent of that role and how they compare to currently available agents will require a careful thought and study. Oral treprostenil remains an interesting compound but needs more study at a TID dosing scheme. The imatinib antiproliferative results are intriguing, but there are some cautionary notes in that study, and future trials of antiproliferatives need to be designed and completed very carefully. It's also important to consider continued referral of pH patients for the opportunity to participate in clinical trials and to assist in complex management decisions. I think it's really of vital importance in a patient group that remains at high risk of poor outcome. I want to turn now to pulmonary hypertension secondary to left ventricular systolic dysfunction. We know these patients that are having RV failure issues in the context of aggressive heart failure therapy are at high risk of poor outcomes. The PITCH-HF trial will look at phosphodesterase 5 inhibition with tadalafil in patients with chronic LV systolic dysfunction with ejection fractions less than 40% who have a mean pulmonary artery pressure over 25 millimeters of mercury or have an elevated suspected pulmonary artery pressure by echocardiographic measures. And the primary endpoint is a robust morbid morbidity and mortality outcome. This is an NIH-sponsored trial. We will be participating at this at the Mayo Clinic, and we would welcome referral of patients with this difficult condition for consideration of entry into this placebo-controlled trial of Tadalafil. These are adults with ejection fractions less than 40% who have pulmonary hypertension, either based on invasive assessment or by echo estimates and who are at high risk for morbidity and mortality in terms of hospitalizations within the past year, need of IV diuretics, or elevated natriuretic peptide levels, without any intent to use or current use of nitrates since we can't use those with the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. These patients will be screened carefully with regard to their eligibility for the trial, and they will then be randomized to either receive Tadalafil or placebo up titrated to the full dose of Tadalafil, and then followed carefully for outcome. I think this is an important trial, and we really should do our best to recruit to the study those patients who may be at risk of poor outcome, who are having issues of pulmonary hypertension and RV dysfunction despite optimal left heart systolic failure therapy. I thank you for your attention today as we discuss this update in the world of pulmonary hypertension. We're always happy to visit with you on the phone or to take queries by email about any patient you might have concern about who has pulmonary arterial hypertension or secondary pulmonary hypertension, for example, who might be a candidate for the PITCH-HF trial. I thank you for your attention and have a great rest of your day.